All right. Welcome, everybody. It is 1.30, and you are at the Watson Waterworks Commission meeting. Um, the first item on our agenda is to approve the minutes of January 12, 2020. I would entertain a motion. Um. Motion by Force, second by Herbst. Is there any discussion? All right. All of those in favor can signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes. Uh, next up. Our director's report. Uh, I'll pass it over to Eric. Yeah, thanks. A um, couple things to note, uh, the lead and copper rule, I wanted to keep that on the forefront because there will be implications to the utility moving forward with that. And so uh, as we get more clarification on the details of each of these items, you know, we'll continue to bring those forward on potential cost as well as just um, uh, additional regulations that we'll have to comply with moving forward. Um, I, I know Scott's been reading through the rule itself, the, you know, 400 some pages. He's further along than I am, so kudos to you, Scott. Um, but if you have any questions on uh, the lead and copper rule itself, on the kind of the cheat sheet I put in there, um, showing what the old rule was, what the new one is, and uh, some of those differences. So. I see the Commissioner Robinson. Do we have an inventory of all of our lead service lines right now? No. So how hard would that be for us to do? Um, it's difficult. It's time consuming. It's not difficult. Um, Scott, do you want to kind of give an update on where we're at on our side as well as the private side? Um, yeah, uh, we have to have that um, registry um, set with the state in January 16th of 2024. Um, we are not at that point going to be required to know exactly what all the materials are, but anything that we do not know what it is will be counted as lead. Um, right now, uh, we estimate we have probably around 5,000 services on the uh, public owned side or the water utility side. Um, the Estimate is a little rougher on the private side. It could be anywhere around eight or nine, even 10,000. I think really the only way to confirm is when we go inside the homes and actually check that pipe that comes inside the home. So we've been doing that as we've been doing meter change outs, um, it, it, you know, on all of the properties. I think the other thing with the lead and copper rule we have to establish a lead service line replacement plan, um, and that's by about the same time frame. And so that's, that's probably going to take some iterations here, so it will come back more than one time as we move forward with that over the next year, year and a half, but um, for the commission's review and, and comment and, and how the commission feels about, you know, moving that forward. Is it creating an ordinance, making it mandated, or is it some other process? So um, so we have really just uh, started kind of breaking ground on that lead service line replacement plan. So over the next few months, I'm sure you'll see some outlines and some concepts for that uh, coming forward for your review. So if, as a follow-up, if this is a requirement for all communities, um, when there, I would imagine, be significant more pressure on the use of the state dollars for replacing the service lines. Would it be advantageous for the city to look at trying to build the case for more funding next year before 2024? And the inventories need to be complete. I'm just looking. If we're going to try to incentivize it, do we want to begin to plan for a, a bigger request to the state? Yeah, I mean, I think we'd love to make a bigger request to the state. This year we're proposing a 100 lead service line replacement on the private side, but if we stay on that pace, it's 30 years before we get through. Um, well, if there's eight to 9,000 private sides. Yeah, could be it's, longer. It's many right. years. So I think the one thing is is that we only have the capacity at this point and how we're doing it to do maybe 100, which so... You know, we'd have to look at, you know, doing something different. I would encourage staff to begin to think, if everybody's moving toward the same reporting date, if, I think it's probably just a matter of time before the regulations follow the reporting. So it would be in our interest to probably be a little bit more innovative quicker, so that we might be able to 
potentially seek funding before everybody else is there? Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree. I do think on our side um, to try to increase the amount that we're doing is going to have a cost to us, yeah. and so those are those are some of the implications that we'll have to take a look at, and the commission will have to review. So, and that'll be part of that plan as well, you know, on how we want to do that with some options. Yes, Mr. Jean. With regard to uh, saying that. If we don't know we're going to put lead on, uh, I trust the private side, but um, and we don't know necessarily all of the other side either, but um, would that be date sensitive? I mean, date based on installation prior to a certain date because after in mid-60s, whenever it was when we switched to copper, those, those services are, are assumed to be copper. Is that correct? Correct. There is a date, and I read it uh, just a while ago. I believe it was 1970. Um, that homes above that could be presumed to be um, copper okay. or material other than lead. I also read in the uh, Wisconsin section AWWA newsletter. It was uh, Green Bay had. I don't know if you saw the article, several pages uh, about replacing the lead services, but I try to make sure and understand that I think that was all on the public side. That did not include the private side. Is, is that correct, or do you know, Scott? They were completely replaced, um, but there was a lot of funding from um, the city of Green Bay as well. Um, there, I don't know if they have the uh, PSC um, replacement program going where they have rate monies available for private side um, but they were uh, applying for the same funding that we were in the last cycles so if that's the case then i trust what you guys are hinting we might be faced with the same thing is that what this, is that without reading all the uh comparisons and the, and the regulations are we forced to replace the private side at our expense we are not forced to replace it at our expense we will need to offer to replace that for them at their expense but we are supposed to have a plan in place to help those that cannot economically accomplish that correct Thank you. so it may be to the point to where um you know there's a payback for the homeowner um you know so similar to some other things that that we do with the city we allow them five years to pay it back or whatever that is at no interest low interest whatever that is you know those programs right or the city would as i think psc allows up to 50 percent of user rates to be used on the private side so um so that would be an option too you know but then that would be borne by all of the users in the city too so there are any other questions or comments? I think there, there was a. Oh, is, are you on the lead and copper rule, Joe? Or? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Sure, okay, Mr. Chief. There was an update on Well Three, and oh. that's pending a letter and acceptance by the uh, by the judge, it's, or the EPA. By the EPA. Okay. Yeah, and I I believe that's part of their legal team, so. So you the know. consent decree would have to be modified, right? Uh, I believe so. Chuck was, um, and this was a previous email a after their meeting a year ago. Um, he wasn't sure at the time if the if that decree would have to be changed yet or not, and and so I think uh, we'll have to find out what information they were going to request from us, and then hopefully then we'll be able to determine a timeline for that. Yeah. Yep. Anything else? We're good. All right. Um, let's move on to item number three. Discussion and update on proposed solar array for the new water treatment facility. I think we'll hear first from Clark Dietz. Yeah. You, you want to come up to the mic, Tanya? This one or that two more? The one in the middle would yeah. be great. If you're... All right, so all of you should, well, first of all, I'm Tanya Westfall from Clark Deed. So I have my colleague, Lisa Zart, here. She's an electrical engineer, and I'm a civil engineer. So um, we're prepared for questions if you have any. 
So um, I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on where we stand. So we were under contract in December and we started um, site survey right away. Um, in the meantime, we looked at calculating what size you would need for an array based on um, the load of the new plant. Um, and that's the first bulleted item here at 3 million kilowatts. When you convert that um, into megawatts, we'll, we're looking at a range of 0.83 to 1.86 for the 40 to 90 percent um, sizing. So that 40 to 90 percent comes from the original RFP um, and perhaps how you'd want to make some choices. So taking that and working with our uh, PV partner, SunVest, we put that into a model to look at uh, what the footprint of something like this would look look like. Um, in that scenario, you would need six to eight acres of viable property per megawatt. That's a range of 16 to 15 acres for the 40 to 90 percent um, sizing of this array. Um, again, we went back and looked at the site to look at what space is available out there. So we did some field survey. Um, as well as um, a little bit of soils work in combination with the city and their backhoe. Um, and what we found out is we don't have 15 acres of property available in one location. So we went back to the city and met with um, Scott and Eric to look at what do we do next. And then in the meantime, uh, the property at 1010 Bugby uh, became potentially available. Um, and I think Eric will talk to you about that in the next item. Um, so that being said, we looked at costs for a single site because it appears there's enough property available to look at a 40% single site array at about six, six to eight acres. And that cost in conservative numbers is 1.5 million. Um, to be able to do a full 90% build out um, would have to be done across multiple sites and that's closer to 3.5 million. Now again, these are very rough numbers. There's some um, contingency built into there because there's a um, when you're looking at sites that the parameters that matter out there for the racking um, as well as how the system performs are um, from the soils perspective the racking systems are generally helical piles or they're driven so the geotech's important in this and and how the cost comes about there is a little bit of bedrock on this site so we've added a little bit of money in there and planning um, in case we run into that. Um, some of the other things are the topography. So part of the reason we looked at different areas at the site is there's some steep topography out there. And if you can imagine how these panels sit next to each other, um, there are rows that are planned at 16 feet apart. And if you're on a, a slope, they shade each other and you would have to put them further apart so you don't get that shading. The other thing is our, our trees on the north property um, that I referred to on the attached map. There's some trees there. So if um, the array would be selected to go to, on the furthest north piece of property, there'd be some tree clearing and associated cost. And if you kept some of those trees, there's a certain proximity you can get to those. Um, so again, these numbers are conservative and it's a pretty big range. Um, but at this point, we're back here looking for some direction from, from you guys. Um, and then we'll come back in the in the spring, which probably isn't too far off, right? Maybe March, April, hopefully, um, and update you again on this. So we, we're open for questions if, if you have anything. Sure. Um, does anybody? Yes, Mr. Jean. You're going to help me out. What was our goal? What percent of the power needs? Did we have a goal? Um, the goal... Well, no, we, we were looking at a 40 to 90% per the RFP. And I think the goal is determined by, you know, your, your budget, your affinity for the project. Okay. Um, uh, with the site that might be discussed, will, will we discuss it for 1010? Will we have to remove trees there that look like there's some vegetation on the south side? Um, I don't know the answer to that yet. But, so we just talked about this maybe week and a half ago, something like that. Um, so we haven't been out there on the site looking. If I had to guess uh, at this point, I'd say yes. Um, you'd probably want to look at, you know, more of a full environmental picture of that. Um, 
you know, like we would do for any site to make sure you're not in, in floodplain or we're not looking at high groundwater. Um, this entire property in particular has some, um, some buried treasures, like old concrete, some rebar. Um, so true. Uh, with regard to that, um, I mean, if we utilize that site, then we'd have to clear some trees. Now, what was the commitment to the neighborhood about buffer zone? So we don't cross our screw up net process, even though we want to do this array of panels. Well, I think the property that we discussed with the, um, you know, the property owners was on the south side of where the treatment facility was, that that would be uh, remain. Yes. Yeah, you know, so it would well, it would be it. screened from the roadside. Um, this next property, which I did reach out to Lisa Rasmussen because it's in her district as well. Um, she she was certainly okay um, with the utilities potential to purchase it. She thought that actually that might be better than leaving it up to, you know, the private sector, somebody to buy it and something. So. But she doesn't feel, but I do think that there will be some considerations with the residents in that area with some of the public forum feedback we had, um, you know, and maybe on the east side or something. So, but, you know, the solar arrays, you know, you can see them, but they're not, on, you know, they're not obtrusive or anything like that. So that was what Lisa uh, had relayed back to me. She didn't feel that that would be um, a detriment to the, to the area, so. Mr. Robinson. So what's our, our payback? And what are we, the, the estimated costs are 1.5 to 3.5 million, depending upon if we go 40 and 90. So what's our estimated savings? Um, if Your we, rate of return on, yes, on those? Return. Um, I, I don't have the answer to that yet. Um, and that would depend on which, what you go with here. Um, what the actual construction costs are and um, the plant itself. So, I don't know, Lisa, you want to talk about how, how we looked at running some of the equipment? Sure. Um, yeah, so our, obviously the plant's not built yet, so we don't have um, our complete load picture, um, you know, whereas if on, on an existing site we'd have utility data to, to, to um, fall back on. So we had to do some estimating um, and we took the design loads and our estimated run times to get to that 3 million kilowatt hours. Um, so that, that at this point is the best that we can do. Um, so the payback would depend too on where that really falls when the plant is operational. But if, if you think you can get a Three million kilowatt hours generated. What does that translate to in terms of savings? We uh, that's something we put together in the next step. Um, once we're looking at the size of this um, and what you would use at the plant in more specific terms. So if you're looking at just general rate of return on a solar array. Um, we have information that we can and work with SunVest, our solar partner, and put that together for you. But in this particular case, we haven't done that specific calculation for your system. So what I can say without making a commitment to the exact, exact number of years is um, solar array equipment has come down as much as 80% in the last 10 to 15 years, which is why people are looking at solar even utility scale solar is being installed because it just makes economic sense. Um, even with the tariffs that were put in place a couple years ago, solar is a cost effective solution for producing power. Now the difference here um, with your array versus several you'll see in the state um, or our surrounding states in particular is that um, people are building arrays to sell additional power back to the utility. This is not intended to do that. All of the power generated here is intended to power your plant. Um, and that's because the bulk rate you would get for power here um, is very low. So um, 
I know that doesn't answer your question, but the answer will come as we move forward. Uh, in the meantime, we can get you something that our general rates of return on other systems, if that's helpful. Okay, we'll follow up with that. And Mr. G. Is it your recommendation that the uh, units be as close to the treatment, water treatment plant as possible? It seemed like that was what was being said here too, but I'm not, I'm just curious your response to that. So, um, it, it'll cost less if it's closer to the plant. And that has to do with having to run, um, well, I can't see this. So if you, if you look at your map, um, on the south side of the plant, there's a small reddish colored box just east of the, the two circular tanks. That's where the electrical comes into the plant. So anything in terms of the array being built has to come back to that location. If you build on the north parcel, there's distance in terms of driveway um, and additional electrical length and also um, stepping of, of the electrical. And I can't, Lisa has to speak to what, what that means, but it, it involves more equipment so that you aren't having losses along that 1,800 feet or something like that. So we did look at big <coughs> round numbers on if you were to have additional electric cost, additional roadway cost, tree clearing, there's much more slope on that northern property. Um, and when you look at that in big round numbers, it becomes um, pretty clear that you're maybe in the $100,000, $150,000 range, um, again, just in round numbers. So it made some sense to take a look at the 1010 property. Yes, Mr. Jean. This doesn't have anything to do with the, the item on the agenda, but I'm, who owns the land where our driveway comes in? Do we own that, and is that in the city? It's not, it's kind of X'd out there coming off the road. To the west? We do own it, and that parcel is in the city. Oh, so that one's in the city. Was that, did the Hans have that in the city? It, it was, the oh, office okay. building there. So correct me if I'm wrong then, Eric, um, the 1010 property is also in the city. That's correct, yeah. So that's a little bit less of a hurdle than to get your project approved on a, a something that's not in your jurisdiction. Obviously not insurmountable, but just a, something else to deal with. Right. It, the RFP, when we put it out, was, we, we asked the firms um, that proposed on it to look at a 40, 60, and 90 percent um, uh, power generation, you know, based on what the overall load is at the plant estimated. So um, not knowing exactly how much property we were going to need, not knowing exactly the cost, and so there would be different options, you know, moving forward. And then as they move forward with um, the actual layout and design, once they pick out the location, then they will determine, uh, based on all three of those options, you know, what a potential payback would be based on the estimates that are being used, you know, like how much we're actually going to generate, use, and, um, and then how much we would save by not purchasing that power from WPS and what that looks like over time. Um, we're not to that point yet, but <clears throat> I think that one of the reasons this is coming now is because Matthew actually approached the utility. Um, if the city or the utility was interested in purchasing that property, because they're going to go out on the open market with it, so they want they they actually approached us. So, um, so then we quick sat down with Clark Dietz and said, well, you know, would this be some sort of viable option as far as? either potentially reducing costs from using the property on the north and bringing it down or um, or would this not be a, you know a good purchase and use for this so um, so that's kind of why um, this preliminary it's an update you know to show where we are and I think we're about ready to step forward into act some actual layout and design which Tanya mentioned that she'll be back in the next month or two with that uh, and some more information so no. Yes, Mr. G. I have one other question. I think the initial purpose for us to buy this land was for future wells. Is that still 
part of our plan, future plan, and I think that needs to be taken into consideration if that's the case where this array goes to. Yeah, I mean, I think that this area is, you know, that's why we bought the large piece of property. And initially, you know, we bought that property to the north. It was $1.1 million. That was what. But initially, they had us purchasing this piece as well. But the purchase price at that time was closer to 1.5 with that other piece to the east. And so we said at the time, we're like, well, you know, that's not necessarily something we need immediately. So then that price went down, you know. To 1.1, which the commission at that time, you know, approved the purchase of that property. So, so just based on those, you know, that information, you know, this property is uh, much less expensive than it was, um, you know, back in 2016. So, yes, Mr. Force. Whenever we have these discussions about alternative power, um, <clears throat> the issue that John raised comes up, and that's the payback issue. Unless things have changed, and perhaps they have, usually the uh, use of solar or wind or some old does not turn out to be the most cost-effective option. And that may again be the case here, I don't know. I would urge us, however, to look a little bit beyond that to the environmental benefit of going with an alternative energy source and also the climate change argument. Um, we're seeing more and more of that, not just in the political realm, but in the commercial realm and the corporate realm. And I would hope that when we make a decision about this, we consider more than just the cost effectiveness and consider some of these other factors. Yes, Mr. Robinson. I agree with Jim, but I, I also, I think one of the problems with return on investment is that they use a, a short horizon. So it would be nice to know what the, the cost is. I think the cost has come down significantly. The technology has gotten better. And, but it's important for us to do our due diligence relative to spending of public dollars on it. So I, I would hope that you'd be able to generate what the return of return on investment is, what the duration or the period of time is uh, for that payback, whether it's a five-year, a seven-year, a ten-year period. I think those are all um, good good information for us to base our our decision going forward. But I, I agree climate change is, is an important component, but there's still economics that, that weigh in. So I, I would offer this if you guys aren't a member of Renew or haven't been involved in that organization in Wisconsin. Um, they have a, a lot of data um, and a lot of information that would be helpful as you move forward with the public. Um, most of the time, the public is receptive to um, something like solar or the renewable. Um, and it, it was surprising a number of years ago when they did this survey that um, it was an, an outstanding number of people. Um, and they're always there to help. So once you get to that point, um, I, I would I, I could help you, or if you guys are already involved in that, they're a great resource. Thank you. Are there other questions? I, I would state and reiterate a little bit what Tanya said. Like when we were going through the public information meetings with, um, you know, through proposing the new water treatment facility and even the wastewater, um, the general public that showed up, I mean, there were questions at each one about have we looked at, you know, alternative energy sources and what are we looking at doing and stuff like that. So um, so I think that the, the public, I think, in, in general terms is, um, is on board with considering these things. And so, and I think it would be good uh, once we get some more details and stuff to have uh, potentially a public information meeting, you know, to kind of roll this out too before final decisions are made, you know, to kind of get that buy-in and, um, and to kind of understand, you know, where the users are, are, are at with this. Um, because we're not looking at a few hundred thousand dollars, we're looking, you know, at a couple million dollars. So it's, um, it's significant. So I think um, on top of what they're already paying. So, so yeah. 
and I guess just for clarification with Clark Deets, did um, you know we in the RFP we asked for you know 40 percent, 60 percent, and a 90 percent you know um, power generation of what our load would be. Is I mean, even knowing that we would have to to get to the 90 percent, we're anticipating different locations that you still want to take a look at at those as well. So all three. 40, 60, 90. Commission still okay with moving ahead with? I think okay. so. Okay. okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. All right. Uh, next item is related discussion and possible action on the purchase of 1010 Bugby Avenue. Eric, why don't you lay it on us? Yeah. We talked about this a little bit. So, Matthew Construction actually approached us. Um, they were looking at putting this property out on, uh, you, you know, out for sale publicly, but I uh, wanted to see if we had any appetite to do this. So, again, we spoke with Clark Dietz to see, you know, for a specific use for solar, if it would be usable. Um, based on what, you know, Tanya and Lisa had mentioned is that, you know, we, we think it would be and the cost would be um, similar. And I think that there's other advantages to have this property as well for our future wells and wellhead protection plans and things like that, you know, because we do have a well right there in the corner of that property. So, um, so based on the cost and stuff uh, with that, if the commission would like us to take a look at this, potentially do a phase one environmental on it, because uh, it wasn't included in the original purchase, you know, of the properties that we were doing. And then Scott has also been looking, maybe going out and doing some test pits, getting their permission to do that, um, just to see if this is actually going to be, you know, a site that that we could use, or if it's been filled with construction debris and stuff. So, yeah. I guess. Oops. Hello. Um, do we have a motion, or is there are there any questions? Yes. Mr. I'll Jean. make a I'll make a motion to authorize staff to uh, do due diligence associated with the possible purchase of 1010 Bungby Avenue. Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second by force. Um, any discussion here? Anything we want to make sure we... I think Eric answered. Oh. We like to have you up and down. <laughs> <laughs> I think Eric answered the question. If we did not do solar arrays, there are other uses for that property. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, with the, yeah. Sure. Uh, any other questions, comments, concerns? All right. Um, all of those in favor of moving ahead with uh, exploration of this property can signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? All right. That passes unanimously. Uh, rain barrel time. Maybe I'll let you, sure. Mr. Force, take it away. Uh, John Robinson and I have been looking at. Um, the issue of rain barrels, and um, uh, John has some information from Superior, Wisconsin. I just wanted to run through my packet first, John, and then you could report on your findings. Is that all right? Okay. So I apologize for all the pages here, and I'll go quickly. Uh, the first page is just a summary of some of the rain barrel programs that are out there, and I included this because it it shows the four different kinds of programs that I could identify. Uh, in League City, Texas, for example, they purchase and resell barrels to their, to their end users. Um, they also offer a rebate, usually in the neighborhood of $25 or $30 per barrel per year to their customers who install rain barrels. In Madison, they don't get involved with uh, purchasing and reselling barrels but they provide information to their customers about where barrels are, how they can be acquired, how they should be installed, uh, and that's that last column, providing guides to installation and maintenance. I have a rain barrel, perhaps some of you do. Installation and maintenance is not a tough thing. Uh, you connect it to your downspout, uh, make a connection between the downspout and your rain barrel. There's a, uh, usually an overflow so that if your rain barrel is full, your downspout goes the way it would normally go, out to the ground. <clears throat> and then there is some kind of, a, of an exit device where uh, the barrel, a spigot and a hose so that you can withdraw 
water from the barrel or, or that uh, water from the barrel goes to a, a garden or something like that. Um, Point does a couple of the things. Uh, River Falls does three of those things. And I just included that to, to show you the kinds of arrangements that are out there. I mentioned that another possibility for uh, a utility would be to publicize the barrels and invite customers to order them from a local supplier. I did look at the Menards and Home Depot prices on barrels, and they are a lot higher than you would get through some of these more organized programs. I quoted, uh, or I found, between $90 and $150. Um, the next page is just uh, an example from League City, Texas, which has a very aggressive program. Just gives you some information on how that program runs. Their rain barrel cost is $65. They show you how to order. Uh, then they have a pickup location where once the barrels are ordered and shipped to the city, the city then conducts some kind of a distribution event, in this case at Hometown Heroes Park, on Saturday, May 30, from 9 until noon. Um, next page is City of Madison. Not a whole lot here. I was surprised. I thought they'd have a more uh, dynamic program. Uh, they do have some information on building your own barrel, which is not that difficult, but some people may find that to be a nuisance. Um, the next piece is River Falls, uh, and the next piece is Stevens Point, and in a minute John will add something on Superior. I found two systems that were interesting to me. One is called Blue Barrel. They're based in California. So the next two or three pages are information on Blue Barrel systems, correspondence that I've had with the folks there. Um, and a little bit about how their system works. One of the wrinkles that they have that's different is that they suggest that you find a source of barrels locally and that you are repurposing barrels that normally would be used and going to some kind of disposal. The comment that they made to me was disposing of these barrels is not easy or inexpensive. So if you could find a local barrel provider they might well be interested in working with the city to provide those barrels for your rain barrel program. I haven't been able yet uh, to find a local provider. I called Marathon Feed and Seed, no. I called um, uh, Great Lakes Cheese, no. Um, I've been advised to contact, there's a laboratory out on 70th. It's in the bio. Oh, the probiotics? Yeah, yeah I uh, but I did not get that contact yet. So that's Blue Barrel, and there's a little bit on their website here. And then the last piece is Rainwater Solutions, which I think has a lot of potential. These folks are in North Carolina. They make their own barrels. They ship them to you. They handle all of the transactions. In other words, if I want to buy a barrel from the city of Wausau, I go to the Rainwater Solutions website. I place the order directly with them. Um, I'm not sure how the payment is handled. But then that barrel is shipped to Wausau, I pick it up and install it. And um, they seem to have a number of um, locations around the country. We could call that website up and just quickly take a look at, uh, at that. As I said, they're in, uh, in North Carolina. This is a section of their website devoted to municipalities. Why don't you just scroll down? I won't spend a lot of time on this, but they do have some case studies uh, of how the barrels are delivered and then how customers who've paid for them uh, through Rainwater, Rainwater Solutions pick them up. They also provide uh, connector kits and a lot of instruction, including videos, on how to install these. And I think most of the communities here do provide a rebate of 25 or $30 per barrel to their customers uh, who use it. I asked League City, Texas, what their volume was. They said they had a couple of events a year, and they sold about 200 barrels per event. So, um, you know, it's possible with our seven or eight or 9,000 customers 
we might get a few hundred out there, depending on what we want to do. John, you want to talk about Superior? And then I'll come back and make a suggestion for what we want to do as a board. Sure, I talked to Megan in the Environmental Service Division for the City of Superior. Uh, they have run an intermittent uh, rain barrel program and composting bin program since about 2010. Um, and they allow people to sign up, but it's, it's, they take used barrels that the, the waste the, the utility has, and then they buy kits from Menards, and they sell the kits, but they also do an educational program with it um, on, on both composting and rain barrel construction and placement and, and maintenance. They've got a report that I had hoped to have by today. I don't have it yet. Um, but uh, again, their, their program is intermittent. Uh, Megan was too new to know how, what the volume of barrels that they went through were. But in 2010, they were selling the rain barrels for $40 and the compost bins for $30. Um, and um, they had organized pickup days. My thought would be is we could look at something like the farmer's market as a pickup site and, and try to, to, to look at it, but I, I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. And I would add that the Rainwater Solutions barrel, they say, fits in the back seat of a sedan. So picking it up uh, is uh, not as difficult as it might be. What I would like uh, is for our board to um, express a firm interest in, in pursuing a program and I'd like to have you review some of the material that we've distributed between now and the next meeting. Perhaps a task force should be formed to maybe come back at the March meeting with a recommendation or two that we could consider. So the first step would be a motion today <clears throat> to seriously pursue a rain barrel program. And then the second measure would be to establish some kind of mechanism of coming up with a recommendation at the next meeting whether that's John and me or whoever else would want to yeah. join us, uh, that would be fine or, or some other way. Sure. So <clears throat> we we have a suggestion on the table. I would. It looks like we have a, a motion to pursue a rain barrel program uh, by Hertz. Um, do I have a second? Second by Gene. Uh, any discussion here? Anything we should? Yes, Mr. Robinson. I would in, encourage us as part of that is to look at the 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 role of the utility in that for, for guidance to the task force. Um, do we facilitate or do we buy and distribute? Um, is, there a, a, a tire, you know, is there an educational component to it? Is it limited to rain barrels? And is there a corresponding credit of some sort, um, stormwater or uh, other credit that would go with it? I think those would be the parameters that sure. I would think you'd want to set for that group? I think those those are great parameters. Um, I don't see any opposition to those as parameters. Um, and I guess one of the things that comes to my mind is I remember the, I don't know if it was the county or if it was the extension that um, had a composting bin program years ago. I know because I have one, um, but it could be an opportunity to partner with maybe another organization. And I'm aware that Extension is involved in some okay. of these community rain barrel programs and rain garden programs around the state. I don't have a list in front of me, but contacting the local Extension sure. office might be a worthwhile endeavor. Yeah, it might be a good thing. Maybe the task force could consider potential partnerships um, outside of even rate payers here. And the Maryland County Solid Waste Management Love Board. it. I'm sure Melissa is all, would be all about this. Don't want to speak for her, but <laughs> I do know her. Cool. All right. So we have a motion on the table to pursue this um, rain barrel program uh, and create a task force. Uh, any more discussion here? Okay. Um, all of those in favor can signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Well, that passes unanimously. Um, I guess I'm looking to you, Mr. Force, and you, Mr. Robinson, maybe to spearhead the task force, um, maybe with somebody on staff here, uh, if that works. Awesome. Um, I don't know if that's Eric or if you want to help identify somebody, but that'd be, yeah, we'll look delighted. forward to an update. Super yep. pumped. Okay, great. Yep. Good. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, uh, last item on our agenda, which I have now buried under paper, uh, 
is to adjourn. So motion. Oh, just kidding. We have. Could I ask? I would like to have the uh, utility do a, a little bit more, um, or get, have an educational program relative to PFAS. Um, going forward, I would be willing to coordinate that. I would ask potentially for Melissa Johnson. We've been working together yes. on some things to give a presentation, but I think that the, the concern is both in the effluent, influent, effluent, and biosolids. Mm -hmm. And just so that we're aware of some of the issues going forward, and I'd like to have that on one of our future meetings. Okay, that sounds good. Maybe in the next month or two, does that sound doable? Perfect. Yeah. We'll connect that and make sure that's on the next agenda. Uh, an upcoming agenda. Okay, well, the last item is to adjourn. Uh, I would entertain that motion. <laughs> Nobody, yes, motion by Robinson, second by Jean. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>